Hi y'all. In this video I'm going to talk about a couple of issues that have arisen in the media this month that have generated quite a bit of excitement and have left me staring at the screen thinking, what the hell are you people thinking? And they relate to Michael Cohen and Andrew McCabe. And it's not even about the timing of the release that Michael Cohen was going to accuse the president of uh, committing a crime or anything to uh, the timing for that to coincide with when the president was going to be meeting with the North Korean dictator. Uh, that's just the way pol that's just the way the media and, and politicians work when there's an adversarial relationship. It's sniping. Uh, I'm not much uh, worried about that. Not much fussed. Uh, but it's the substance of what these two guys uh, have to say as they've gotten out there in front of the world and you know, said what they've had to say. And so I'm going to talk first about Andrew McCabe and a story that isn't a story but was a story and shouldn't have been a story. And I don't know why it was a story because anyone who knows anything about anyone, anything knows that that's not a story. But, you know, that's the media for you. And it was the, and no one objected line. This got a lot of uh, play, uh, got a lot of airtime. And I'm thinking, my God, that is like the most non-important thing ever said. Of course no one objected. Look, you know, when I would get a... Uh, let's think about Andrew McCabe. Let's just not think of Andrew McCabe. Let's think of a generic person who is accused of wrongdoing or suspected of wrongdoing. And what... Uh, uh, an interview, an interrogation, which is politely called an interview, might look like of such a person who has committed uh, or is thought to have committed some really bad crime like uh, rape or something. Any investigator going in there uh, was not going to object to the conduct. It would not be a good argument for that person to walk into court and go, well, your honor, when I was in there telling this to the cops, none of them objected to my having committed the rape and everything I had to tell them about it. Of course I wouldn't have objected to it while I'm in in the interrogation with you. I want you to tell me things. And it's, <laughs> if I start objecting to what it is that you've said, and you start to get wise that maybe I'm angling to, I don't know, prosecute you later, you might be less forthcoming. If I just go along with it and let you talk, I'm likelier to get a lot of information, a lot more information out of you. So of course I didn't object when you talked about how you abducted a little girl and raped her. I'm, I, I probably even agreed that, you know, sometimes they dress in particular ways. There are all these different strategies to, like, build a rapport with the person who you're handing the rope to, and you're like, all right, here it is. Go, hang yourself. Uh, can I give you some more rope, sir? Would you like it gold-plated, sir? Anything else I can get you, sir? That's the nature of the interview. Uh, it does not mean that I actually agree with the person. I'm trying to get them to confess as much as possible. I want them to think I like them. So this uh, Andrew McCabe goes into the congressional hearing behind closed doors, which he's now talking about in public, so <laughs> why people weren't confiding in him, I can't possibly imagine. But it was already known in Washington, and anyone who's paying attention, at the time that he went in for that meeting, that he was the target of an investigation in relation to uh, improper disclosures of confidential information. In particular, a, a conversation that happened between him and just one other person, uh, which just so happens that the leak of that private conversation hap happens to have made uh, McCabe look like the good guy, you know, almost like a, some kind of exculpatory release, a selective re release of information with a spin on it to make him look like he's doing the proper thing and to shift blame somewhere else. This was already known at the time. That happened in... Uh, you know, the, the latter part of the preceding year, people knew this. So, of course, when he goes in to talk to the congressional people behind closed doors, uh, the party that's going to be hostile to him, the Republicans in this case, aren't going to say, hey, uh, Mr. Acting Director, before you go any further, um, I would really seriously like to object to your having done this. But please feel free to bare your soul to me. Tell me everything, even though I'm putting you on notice right now, and I'm really paying attention to get you later. I suspect you something. I'm going to object to your activities. But by all means, proceed. Or, you know, that, I guess that's one tactic. Or do you think the Republicans are going to go, just keep talking, you talk, 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 uh, and ask questions. Oh, and uh, you said it was based on this fact, and then what did you do? And then what did you do? And what was the justica justification for that? Uh, a non-hostile conversation is much more likely to get a person who has done something illicit to be forthcoming than a hostile conversation, a confrontational, inquisitorial type conversation. Um, not the best way to build a rapport and not the best way to approach a guy like McCabe who's worked in law enforcement for many years and knows 
uh, knows. I don't even know why he would say it because it's just it's, it, it would. Uh, it, it just leaves me dumbfounded to think that a law enforcement official would think that that is actually an argument that the people he's uh, talking to about the actions that he's taken, which are being questioned, uh, aren't objecting to him as he's in the process of laying out all of his activities. Anyway, but apparently the media thought this was something important. Oh, yeah, and no one objected. Yeah, well, uh, Your Honor, I don't know why I'm in here. You, you all like the jury and everything. The cops didn't didn't object when I confessed. I mean, they seemed like they were on my side. What about, what about me? I feel betrayed. They, they turned their back. We were buddies. They turned their back on me. It just doesn't happen. Anyway, it's not, it is of no moment whatever that no one objected. It's entirely uh, explicable why they wouldn't object. They want the guy to be forthcoming, telling them as much as possible and locking him down on some facts and whatnot so they can come back later to ruin his life, which they uh, have su successfully done because of his conduct which uh, in included some findings of dishonesty, under oath even. Which brings me on to the next topic. Uh, why Michael Cohen is the darling of the media right now. Um, it is a complete mystery to me. Uh, there are many lawyers involved in this, uh, Democrat lawyers who have been prosecutors who are talking about, oh, the Michael Cohen story, blah, blah, blah. He's going to come in, he's going to accuse Trump of this. Of yeah, is it any surprise that he's going to accuse Trump of something? The question it's easy to make an accusation. The question is, is there evidence? Can can it be short can you shore it up somehow? Is there something more than just Michael Cohen said it? And the reason for it is this. And in, the reason I mentioned the fact that there are a lot of lawyers on on that side who are out there, you know, really talking it up. It's because they've been prosecutors, they've been defense counsels, they've been involved in litigation. And anybody who's been involved in litigation, particularly in criminal matters, or in any matter really, but criminal matters is relevant here, knows there's exactly two types of witnesses that you just can't bring into the stand. That juries won't credit at all, and judges don't credit No one gives them any credence. Uh, the first is pedophiles. You can be a murderer. You can be a rapist. You can murder children. You can rape adults and murder them. But what you can't do is fuck kids. Because if you do, there is no redemption for you in the eye of a jury. Now, if your case turns in any way on the assertions of the most upstanding pedophile you've ever met, like except for the fact that the person's raping kids, like the, the best person ever, say a Catholic priest, for example, it, uh, it doesn't matter otherwise what they are. The bare fact that they have been convicted of molesting children means they have no credibility at all. You cannot rehabilitate that witness. And if you think that you can, there is a word for prosecutors who bring cases that depend in some way on the assertions of pedophiles whom they're trying to rehabilitate credibility-wise on the stand. And the word for, for those cases is acquittals, that not guilty. You're not getting a conviction on that. Uh, you can be a con man. You can be a, a mafioso who lies, runs frauds, uh, you know, cons people, tricks them, all those terrible, horrible things. You can rehabilitate on the stand that type of person. What you can't rehabilitate, or it's extremely difficult to rehabilitate, is a person who's not simply a liar, but a perjurer. A person who has sworn to tell the truth and then done the opposite. Juries, there's no coming, there's real, no real coming back from that. It might as well be a pedophile, because that's where their credibility lies. Because it is already not just that you will lie, anybody will lie under some circumstances, but it's that when you take a solemn vow not to do that, and then you do it. There's, there's no reason at all to credit you. There's nothing you can tell me that is going to make me believe that you're not lying to me now. Because the one thing that is usually a, a pathway to rehabilitate a fraudster, or con man, or something of that, that type, of a professional liar, is that the lies that he told weren't under oath, and the lies, and, and I'm sorry, the story he's telling now is under oath. And uh, juries will often credit that. But if you've perjured yourself, juries don't. Uh, so those are the two types of witnesses that you just can't rehabilitate. And it's so bad, even CNN right now has the articles coming out about uh, Michael Cohen and, and, you know, the the, re the failed rehabilitation attempt. Uh, even Chris Saliza, who's like terminally oblivious to everything in the world, is, is catching wise to the fact that, you know, uh, this could have been a story of redemption, which is completely false. You know, I sure I lied for Trump, blah, 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 but... I'm a changed man. No one buys it once you've perjured yourself. Uh, but he's noticed, like, but, you know, this one little lie he told today might throw, might throw a spanner and then works. <laughs> like, yeah. The reason juries don't credit people who've committed perjury 
is because once you take that oath, it concentrates the mind. And, you know, there's none of this, oh, I was speaking loose, I was, it was, the, once you've been convicted of perjury or pleaded guilty to it, uh, it, it's quite clear that nothing focuses your mind on the importance of telling the truth. You have already shown that you will lie anytime you want, uh, no matter what. Cohen has done that, and today he uh, has told what is, uh, well, <laughs> to be charitable, not true, uh, to be slightly more honest, uh, bold, uh, you know, an out-and-out -out lie. He says, he testified today that uh, when asked by Jim Jordan, I think it was, if he want, if he has any angst against the president, anything, any beef against the president for not having offered him a position in the White House, Let me put it that way, Cohen's argument is, no, I didn't want a position in the White House, I was offered positions, I didn't want it, I argued with Reince, Reince Priebus, got in trouble because I didn't take a position, blah, blah, it goes on and on and on. Chris Saliza, CNN, uh, had to inconveniently recall, well, you know, he did in 2000, I think 16, appear on our network with Chris Cuomo, and the substance of that conversation is that Cuomo asked him, are you angling for a job in the White House? Cohen said, yes. <laughs> and if you were offered a job in the White House, would you take it? And Cohen says, 100% yes. <laughs> Because as soon as he said that, like the Trump campaign people, the Trump administration people were like, it, everyone knows that he wanted to be chief of staff. It's like the worst kept secret in Washington. Everybody knows it. And it is just, this is precisely why a person who's been convicted of lying under oath once has no credibility in the eyes of juror, jurors, lay people, people who aren't lawyers necessarily, very rarely lawyers, almost never cops, and certainly not in criminal cases, uh, who aren't journalists, not that a journalist's education means much. They're just ordinary people. They might be a factory worker, they might be an auto mechanic, a daycare worker, a stay-at-home parent, uh, you know, a part-time student. What you, it, from any any walk of life, you just don't know what you are. And these people have the good sense that God gave a goose to recognize that a person who purchased himself once, uh, if he tells you, if you're holding an umbrella, and you hear drops coming on, he tells you that it's rain. You might want to move the umbrella and check because. <laughs> he is a profligate liar. He's a pathological liar. You can't believe anything that he says. Which is not the same for people who are just liars when they're not under oath, but who tell the truth under oath. oath. Those people do exist. The, the oath does mean something for a lot of people. Uh, as I mentioned, it concentrates the mind. And plus there are legal uh, problems that follow from lying under oath that don't necessarily follow from not lying under oath. But in any event, once you do it under oath, that, that's it. You have no credibility. But here all week, the media is, Michael Cohen this, it's a... You know, he can rehabilitate himself. It's a redemption. No, it's not. Develop the good sense that God gave a goose that's possessed by jurors. A person who has lied even once under oath has no credibility on any subject at all for any reason. You can't rehabilitate that, which is why another reason, well, uh, McCabe has not been convicted of having lied under oath, but there is the... Uh, Report from the IG that it, you know, based on the facts that we know, uh, that there's no, been no conclusion in law found in a court, it does appear he has misled us under oath, uh, willfully, uh, lied to us under oath. So, what are you going to do? Those people never get them on your air again. They have nothing to say to you. They only detract from your credibility by showing that you're so stupid as to think that you can get a confirmed perjurer on your air or a person who is suspected of perjury for good reason where you can show what the perjured statement is and show that it's false. The only thing you're lacking is a conclusive determination in a court of law. Uh, it only undermines your credibility to the extent that you even have it as a journalist. So the fact they're willing to give McCabe air is, is all to his credit that he can you know, hoodwink these retards into letting him on and all to their discredit for being so stupid as to think they can get that guy on and get anything, anything positive out of it. And same thing with the people going around talking about Michael Cohen all week. Whether it be cautious or couched language or not, the, the simple fact is, confirmed perjurer, known perjurer, admitted perjurer, no use for you. Go away. Nothing you say matters at all. And mind you, the credibility of the person up against whom he might go is Donald Trump, who, <laughs> whose lawyers were very wise to make sure that he did not do a sit-down interview with, with anybody under oath, because he would talk himself into a jail cell like that. I mean, that man does, does not seem to be able to... Uh, a charitable way to put it is that he, he tells the truth, just his perception of reality alters moment to moment. 
that's a charitable and strained way to put it. The other way to put it is that, you know, what everybody knows about Trump. He's a bullshitter. He's always bullshitting. But somehow he still gets stuff done behind the scenes. Uh, bullshitting is like his shtick. And I don't see any way that, that practiced shtick of 30 years is going to go away once you sit him down in front of a lawyer and he swears out, out an oath to tell the truth. Maybe the oath will concentrate his mind. But if I were his attorney, I also would not be banking on that fact. <laughs> I'd be like, no, Mr. President, uh, just let us handle this. You just uh, will draft some responses and uh, redraft and redraft and redraft until we get it just vague enough to, to count. And then you can say, yeah, I'll swear to that. And we'll send it off. And then we won't, have, we won't take any questions. No follow-up. <laughs> you know, very wise strategy. It's a good strategy for anybody, but particularly for a client like Trump. But anyway, they're not willing to give Trump any credibility because he lies all the time, even though they're not lies under oath. But Cohen and, and McCabe are something like the media darlings. You can't reform perjurers. Stop it. All right. Have a great day.